Hello, I'm Jim McLennan, and I'm going to be talking about the ritual healing theory and a group psychokinesis experiment that pertains to it. I've gathered anomalous experience narratives from a variety of countries. A, a typical way of eliciting a response is to ask the person, if you have had a very unusual experience, would you describe it briefly? In Northeast North Carolina, the most common type of anomalous experience are paranormal dreams. Then comes apparitions, spiritual healing, sleep paralysis, psychokinesis. The ritual healing theory was derived from the realization that anomalous experiences are correlated with certain variables. First, they're, they're all correlated with each other they're all correlated with psychological symptoms, which seem related to consciousness. They're all correlated with dissociation, absorption, and hypnotizability. So that leads to the hypothesis that anomalous experiences are deviations from normal consciousness. There's a schematic diagram of the ritual healing theory. Uh, People have anomalous experiences in all societies, and these experiences lead to belief in spirits, souls, life after death, magical abilities. And these, these beliefs are the ideological foundation for shamanism, humankind's first religious form. So I refer to this as an experiential source theory. Experiences lead to belief. And people who have these beliefs exist in every society. And people who have a lot of anomalous experiences have very profound beliefs. And that makes them prime candidates to be shamanic practitioners. Shamanic practitioners perform rituals which have uh, important impacts on their audiences. They, have, they produce placebo effects and hypnotic effects. And th this, this claim, this hypothesis is not that controversial. We know that hypnotic effects and placebo effects are very powerful. So the performance of shamanic rituals over the last 70,000 years, according to the ritual healing theory, has had, had important evolutionary impacts. It's selected for genotypes associated with absorption, dissociation, and hypnotizability. So people who have those genes have had an evolutionary advantage, and these genes have been selected by shamanic rituals over the last 70,000 years. And we know that these propensities, absorption, dissociation, hypnotizability, are highly correlated with anomalous experience. So that's caused an evolutionary cycle to go around and around the last 70,000 years. We human beings have shaped ourselves so that we're quite different from animals. We have a, a propensity for spirituality and religiosity as a result. Now, my later research indicated it's not just anomalous experiences, but there's a whole constellation of variables that were affected by shamanism. And human beings are different from animals. And one way that they're different is that humans experience psychosis, a disruption of this internal mental dialogue that's going on. So uh, psychosis, schizotypy, unusual experiences, mystical experiences are all been, have been shaped by this evolutionary process. And with the uh, effect or with the intrusion of socialization, which teaches people performance skills, we have shamanism, and then that results in this evolutionary cycle that I talked about before. So this is the ritual healing theory. Now, the theory seems to indicate or it implies that anomalous experiences are all aspects of unusual or deviations from normal consciousness, but well, that uses the word consciousness, and I can't precisely define that term very well. So I'm going to resort to Hobson's model of consciousness, which portrays it in a physiological terms. Hobson argued that there's three dimensions to consciousness. The first one I'll talk about is a chemical modulation dimension. Uh, Waking consciousness is associated with high aminergic chemical systems. It's also concerned with external 
input, a focus on the external world rather than the internal world. So we have open or external focus, high, I'm energic, and then we have activation level, either low or high. So we're going to be here, up here in this corner of the cube. Uh, and that's where we'll have a waking consciousness. Now, sleeping's down here on the floor. And Hobson wants to point out to us that one, one value of his model is you can visualize altered forms of consciousness. Here's hallucination, which is kind of a combination of waking and, and dreaming consciousness. So, so his model explains the daily cycle that mammals and human beings go through. Here's waking consciousness, and in the evening time, the aminergic system declines, activity level declines, the more internal focus, and you pass into non-rapid eye movement sleep. Then as the evening wears on, you pass into rapid eye movement sleep and dreams, and then you cycle back and forth between non-rapid eye movement and rapid eye movement, and in the morning, you return to waking consciousness. So we can with this model, we can think about other forms. We can think of states of diminished consciousness and also lucid dreaming, which is a state of dreaming where you're aware that you're dreaming. So it's a, kind of like a combination of the aminergic waking state and what might be referred to as a cholinergic or non-aminergic uh, dreaming and sleeping state. But let's think. So Hobson's model is useful to psychical researchers because it helps us to think about the nature of anomalous experiences. The, the traditional or, or common way of thinking about them within parapsychology is that they're something that happens with, with some kind of unexplicable beam proceeding from the brain, like waking ESP is some kind of communication, the information's coming into the brain. Psychokinesis is some kind of a projection from the brain. Uh, that affects the exterior reality, but uh, there's, a, there's various schools of thought regarding consciousness, which su suggests that it's not just a physiological brain. Consciousness is more than that, that there may be collective elements to consciousness, group consciousness or uh, things like that, a larger consciousness. And so if we think about uh, anomalous experiences as disruptions, of our consciousness, that gives us an insight in how it could be interacting with our human physiology. For example, paranormal dreams, that would be occurring here in the dream section, but there's something different, something that distinguishes paranormal dreams from regular dreams. And that's a connection to this other form of consciousness, waking consciousness. Paranormal dreams have some kind of connection to reality. So they, they predict the future or they see something that happens far away or deep in the past, gaining unknown information, something anomalous is occurring. Apparitions, what distinguishes them from hallucinations? That's that connection to waking shared reality. Somehow information is imparted. The person is aware that there or has a has a message that there's a death occurring or some important piece of information is being transmitted by the apparition in some cases. Secondly, more than one person perceives the apparition. Spiritual healing is something really powerful going on. Perhaps a sign of perhaps a kind of psychokinesis, but. It seems to be uh, even more deeply involved with a connectedness between people. Sleep paralysis is awaking in the night, not being able to move, but it's also often connected to apparitions and uh, compels a large number of people to believe there's some kind of uh, evil force oppressing them or interacting with them. Psychokinesis. Uh, that's a that's a group phenomenon. In other words, everyone who is present during the psychokinetic event perceives it. So it, it seems like it's intrinsically related to waking consciousness, but it has dreamlike characteristics in that it, it violates the way things are supposed to be. There's some kind of fantasy element to it. And the psychokinesis is also connected to seemingly spiritual intelligence or, or forces. It, it creates a kind of folklore surrounding it regarding 
uh, spirits, souls, life after death, and magical abilities. The outer body experiences are similarly. They, they have characteristics which uh, defy explanation within the waking consciousness reality. Uh, so it would seem like they have some kind of link to this other form of consciousness, a REM dreaming consciousness, it would seem. And religious experiences, they have this connection to, uh, well, there's a, there's a kind of a continuum between psychotic experiences and uh, religious experiences. And a lot of it's related with obsessive compulsion and other forms of unusual mental states. Uh, religious experience oftentimes being, having a therapeutic quality. So rather than being a negative, it's beneficial. Other forms are synchronicity, which shows some kind of structure, some cosmic structure to consciousness, which we don't understand. We might as well acknowledge that we don't understand it very well. Waking ESP is seemingly waking consciousness, but some connection with this interprocess. Information is spontaneously uh, bursting forth within the brain. NDEs are like OBEs, out-of-body experience, only connected with a certain event, a life-threatening event and then uh, having a transcendent quality and ex uh, experiential uh, validity to them, a compelling belief. And same with UFOs, a collective behavior kind of phenomena occurring, more than one people can perceive it. So I, I acknowledge that we, we haven't been able to put these within these cells very clearly, but they all seem to be related to this waking conscious, dreaming conscious connection and going to be located here in this unexplained area. And I would predict that young people who are listening to this talk, they during their lifetime will see major advances occur and a greater understanding, which will probably help us gain a deeper understanding of these anomalous experiences. Because uh, during my lifetime, we've made major advances with regard to dreaming. We, uh, there, we have a far deeper understanding of dreams than we had 50 years ago. So we can expect there to be progress in that area if we stick with the traditional way of doing psychical research and parapsychology. I don't know that we're going to see that progress. Proving, some, proving that something is not explained uh, and, and perhaps can't be explained, that's not a pathway towards uh, science. So let's think about the evolutionary process. These ancient uh, aquatic worms had the capacity for waking state, and then they evolved the capacity for sleeping state. They would stop moving when exposed to difficult environments. And then with the night day cycle, they developed a sleeping cycle. The first REM dreaming states are found in birds and mammals. So we think that they evolved at this stage in ancient reptiles, they developed the capacity for sleep. So that, that must have some kind of evolutionary function. And we think that sleep, perhaps, not only does it affect the creation of memory or the placement of memories, but it also has a kind of preparatory function. In other words, the body uh, is, is creating a stressful scenario, and then the body is responding to that, practicing responding to it. So it benefits. About a million years ago, our Homo erectus ancestors gained the ability to control fire, and that had a major impact on them. That uh, helped them uh, get a better diet because they could cook their food. And also it changed their recreational activities. They would be, they would be protected from predators when they huddled around fires. So those who had a potential, those who had dissociative abilities had survival advantages. They would achieve a relaxation response and they'd be more likely to pass on their genes to future generations. The first travelers and adventurers and anthropologists who visited the shamans in Siberia observed shamanic rituals. The shaman went into trance and psychokinetic phenomena was associated with this, ostensibly authentic psychokinetic phenomena. People had very, very powerful experiences. Modern hunter-gatherers in the Kalahari Desert still gather around fires and engage in trance rituals which generate 
paranormal experiences and they're designed to to, to result in spiritual healing. Various Native American uh, tribes have tent shaking traditions where they tie up their medicine man and put him inside this specially constructed tent. And then they gather around the tent sides, shake in response to their questions. They, they're in contact with spiritual forces and they, they also experience as many other psychokinetic phenomena, uh, lights, anomalous lights, moving lights, weather control. Uh, there's a connection between the ritual and, and psychokinesis. During the spiritualist era, there's a huge amount of psychokinetic experience and apparitional experience and also fraud. So Kenneth Bachelador, uh, a more modern psychical researcher, developed a theory which explains this type of phenomena, group psychokinesis. Bachelador argued that uh, paranormal phenomena, particularly psychokinesis, was thwarted by fear of psi. And also we have a resistance, ownership resistance, he referred to it, ownership resistance. We don't wish to be to believe that we're the source of the psychic phenomena. And Bachelor argued that artifacts can overcome these obstacles. People put their hands on a table in the darkness of a seance situation, and then they experience the table moving it around, moving around. And this, it, he argued that this could be an artifact. Someone uh, would be in slight amount of trance and be pushing the table unconsciously, then others would experience that phenomena and that would help them overcome their fear of psi. And as a, as a, as a result, they would develop a powerful enough belief so that authentic psychokinesis could occur. And later revision, Bachelor talked about the universal creative principle, but now we're getting to this idea that there's some kind of collective or group consciousness. Bachelor experienced a decline in the phenomena and he, he wasn't sure why. And he contacted Walter von Lukadal, whose theory offered an explanation for this. Uh, Lukadal was uh, combined psychical research theories or observations with quantum theory. And in quantum theory, there's the argument that quantum particles remain correlated even when separated. And this has been demonstrated empirically. Also, within quantum theory, the, the observation thwarts the decay. In other words, it stops the collapse of the wave function. This is known as the Zeno effect, a watched pot never boils. So Lukadal argued that psi involves quantum processes, and that, that entails a kind of observation effect. You know, the observer thwarts the phenomena, especially skeptical observers. So as a result, psi has hiding qualities. The more scrutiny, the more documentation, then the less psi you experience. So Bachelor reduced his scrutiny and he found that the phenomena seemed to return. So the Toronto Parapsychological Research Society conducted a very interesting experiment. They wanted to contact a fictitious spirit, which they had collectively uh, created in their minds and they meditated together and then they wanted to see some kind of apparitional phenomena. They contacted Bachelor. He suggested some kind of seance like and relaxed atmosphere. They tried that. They got communicative wraps, table tipping, table levitation, other PK. The, the results seemed to indicate that there was a, a collective uh, ideology that facilitated this success and perhaps a group consciousness involved. Uh, that you didn't actually need uh, actual spirits. The collective uh, group could, could, create, could create the phenomena. John G. Neihart was a, known as a poet laureate of the Plain State. He, he's also the author of the book Black Elk Speaks, who's very familiar with Lakota Sioux shamanism. He, he founded the Society for Research on Rapport and Telekinesis, or Surat, in 1961, and they started getting uh, very powerful psychokinetic phenomena, communicative wraps, table movements, levitations, earthquake effects, supports, matter through matter. And they engaged in a lot of photographs of levitating tables. 
So they, the goal was you create this seance-like environment. The table gets up in the air. You grab your camera and you take a picture of it. They contacted J.B. Rhine. Rhine sent his associate, William Edward Cox, to investigate. Cox developed, he constructed a mini lab, a locked and sealed container, and uh, the phenomena or the, seemed to, seemingly was able to make things come in and out of the container. Now, he constructed a micro switches in the floor so it would switch on a film camera and created an hour's worth of very, very strange for, uh, films. He tried presenting it before the parapsychologist and they laughed at him and mocked him and refused to allow him to continue to publish his, his findings. Uh, he, they organized a more careful replication and as Luca Dow might have predicted, they failed to replicate. I began my research into Surat in 1981. There are dozens of participants. They all claimed extremely anomalous experience. Now, I'm a sociologist, so my job isn't to prove that the claims are authentic. I just write down what pe people say. I'm gathering evidence. I found that the scrutiny seemed to inhibit the phenomena. There's a severe stigma associated with this kind of thing. There's very unusual forms of fraud. The phenomena itself seems to engage in fraud. It seemed to me the only way that I could gain a certainty about the Surat phenomenon would be to organize a group myself, a, a psychokinesis research group. I tried four different groups. We met for three months, uh, in more than three months. I contacted Bachelador. The main thing I learned from interacting with Bachelador is he had an absolute powerful belief himself, and I, I don't have that. I did not have that. I was not a powerful believer. In fact, I have somewhat of a skeptical streak and we got no good results. But I was exposed to a lot of phenomena with the Surats. It was, had a powerful impact on me. I saw very, very strange things. I was able... While I was investigating Surat, I communicated with the raps, rapping sounds that came out of the wood floor, concrete floor, bare ground, floors of restaurants, floors of a museum, very powerful anomalous phenomena. T t table tipping experiments where the table moved, where I was the only one who had my hands on it. Very, very powerful. But all the, during the entire time period, I, I felt I never had complete control over the experimental situation. So uh, after publication of my book, The Entity Letters, people started contacting me and they wanted to, they wanted to form a new group. And uh, I, I, I was so slightly uncomfortable because I, I, can't, I, I can't distinguish fraud from an authentic phenomena. But we started meeting on August the 9th with five people and we had weekly Zoom meetings and our goal was to create Group PK. So my hypotheses are derived from the ritual healing theory. The experiential source hypothesis would be that experiences change people's beliefs. The shamanic effectiveness hypothesis that there should be some kind of a benefit from doing this, at least some kind of psychological benefit. The trickster hypothesis that the, we would expect the phenomena to have this hiding quality, this quirky quality, which we don't understand very well. My group members had a very high level of paranormal experience. So here's an example case. Uh, David was attending a, a psychic development workshop and uh, that evening, a red lettering appeared on his bathroom wall. It's a lyrics from a Pink Floyd song. Remember when you were young, you shone like the sun. And this was his partner's father's, uh, one of his favorite songs. So this is, a, a an experience that supports belief in life after death. The photograph is of a, a souvenir plague mask that was on Kathy's mantle. And on August 9th, during our first session, this mask came flying off and uh, she found it on the floor as our kind of a poltergeist event and perhaps an omen for the COVID-19 virus that uh, began in January 2020 in the United States. 
By December, I, I, I was unable really to replicate the Philip group. We didn't have a unifying ideology. The attendance was irregular, but people told stories of their experiences, and this, these people had experiences. So every week, there would typically be one person who had some kind of story to tell. I created a kind of altar uh, with uh, figures that the participants had suggested. Main one is Saint Expeditus. He was a Roman soldier, early Christian martyr. So we were hoping that one of these would help us get uh, experiences. One participant suggested that we contact Ed Cox, and we, we talked about this. Cox was agnostic. He was not a believer in life after death. He, he felt the evidence wasn't sufficient. Uh, so they, they said, well, let's contact him on the other side and see if he's changed his opinions. He could tell us what his thoughts were at, at present. And so in December 2019, at four o'clock in the morning, I awoke to raps coming out of the ceiling and I investigated it in the morning and there's no explanation for them. I don't know what to think of it. I can't explain it. There, it, there must be some normal explanation, but I couldn't come up with that. It, you would think, well, maybe it's the pipes, but I never had heard that kind of thing before. So in March, we decided, well, we'll do a ritual for St. Expedite. And so here's some special pound cake and uh, there's also some water and a candle that are burnt for him. And the next night, Ed Cox's photo uh, fell. And so we had a kind of a psychokinetic phenomena, which I, I couldn't figure out what mechanism might cause that. But if a, a person came up close and blew with all their might, they might be able, they would create that phenomenon. The group also also was hearing electronic voice phenomena, which is not unusual for Zoom, by the way. A dog barking, voices, and the people who thought it might be demons. And then one woman got electronic voice phenomena at her house. Uh, and, but also very powerful psychokinetic uh, phenomena was occurring. One time she came home and she heard shouting upstairs and then she was afraid, thought that maybe there were intruders, but her computer had switched on and there was a program, a comedy program was playing about life after death experiences. So some of this was kind of meaningful. One participant, Steve, described a near death experience. He said he was climbing a stone staircase and at the top he would meet death where he would join with the all in all. And I, I found this interesting because this coincided with Dr. Nyhart, the founder of Surat. That was his philosophical orientation. That was his vision of life after death. So in March, on March the 6th, Steve told us about his vision of Ed Cox. And uh, he wasn't, it was a very dissociative kind of experience. He wasn't sure when it occurred. He just knew he had a memory, a powerful a dissociative memory regarding this vision of a contact with Ed Cox. And Cox said, Cox told him that every question had been answered. It all had been revealed. And Cox wanted him to tell me the word Susan, Sue or Susie. Cox said, he will know what this is about. Uh, I didn't find this to be particularly meaningful, but uh, the people in the group said, well, this has to do with Susie Smith. She's a medium. You need to get her book. So I, okay, that's what I decided I would do. So at that same session, uh, participant Kathy's mom had died on, and she went to, had gone to her mother's house and uh, where her mo mother had lived. There's, they found a key on the floor and they, that, she thought that was very, very powerful. And that had to have some kind of meaning and had to have been come from her mother, but she wondered, what does it mean? And uh, she was riding back on the train and the woman beside her was reading a book. And sure enough, here's a key on the cover. She got home, she turned on her computer and the computer had a screen uh, advertising keys. And she went out to look at her car and there were keys on the pavement. So keys were very, very important. And so, so I purchased Susie Smith's book through Amazon and uh, it comes and sure enough, there's a key on the front. So 
uh, it would seem that this is somehow connected very much to Ed Cox and all these other phenomena, but I don't know how to evaluate this, you know, or, or what to think of it. I'm a sociologist, so I'm just write down what happens. This is a story, and uh, I read this book, and uh, Susie Smith is a famous medium, and she uh, is getting up in years, and so she devises a code, and she uh, uh, embeds this code, which would indicate some phrase, a phrase. She embeds it in her computer at her foundation, and then after she dies, the situation is that any medium that comes up with this code, no one else would know it, so that would be evidence for survival after death. So I read the finish of the book, and it turns out that uh, no one has solved this code. And I, 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 I remember talking to Ed Cox about this, and Cox was telling me about all the different people who have devised codes, and none of them have ever been solved. And Cox would say, you know, there's something that can be learned from this. There's meaning to this. Why hasn't there been compelling evidence regarding life after death? You know, that's something to think about. You know, there's a trickster phenomena going on. Uh, well, I was upstairs April 10th, and I heard a crashing sound. Now, downstairs, I was looking at the Surratt uh, photo books, photograph albums. There's hundreds of levitating, uh, what, around 100 of levitating uh, photographs, and I'm looking at them while well, the chair fell over. Some kind of psychokinetic phenomena occurred, I, I would suppose. The group, I had them do controlled drop ball experiments. Uh, this is a computer online game. The idea is to get the ball to move to one side or the other. We're trying to move it to green. The group completed three experiments. They achieved a statistically significant score with a P less than 0.02. These people are really astonishing. They they have psychokinetic ability. We did a spoon bending party, and one participant, Boris, who has a long history of psychokinetic experience, poltergeist phenomena in his house, he did this bend, and then later he did it on his own, bend after bend after bend. It became kind of a hobby for him. Uh, Boris has a long history. Uh, objects would appear and disappear in his house. These are things that happened while the group was meeting during those, the weeks. They, they heard an explosive sound and his wife investigated. She didn't find any explanation. There's a destructive poltergeist. He's experienced major psychological distress in the past. October 29th, his bicycle tire exploded. October, uh, December 24th, that a pattern appeared on his arm. Then I was having experiences. My hearing aid batteries disappeared, but then they reappeared three days later. My car keys disappeared. I know it sounds funny, but uh, you know, we searched high and low. My wife helped me searching, helped me search. I had a strange experience with my tent while I was backpacking. The headlamp, uh, I accidentally dropped it and couldn't find it. Disappeared. Then it later appeared inside the pack. Uh, meditation band disappeared and reappeared three days later. And here's a hearing aid battery. Uh, these are strange things. On October 12th, I was backpacking on the Appalachian Trail, and I here's where I was spending the night in this hammock, and I uh, accidentally dropped my headlamp onto the ground during the night, and I searched all over diligently, couldn't find it, looked very, very carefully all morning uh, looking for it, couldn't find it. Then later on, I found it here in the backpack in the bottom of my backpack uh, sealed inside a plastic bag. So I felt that was very, very astonishing. But then later I looked at this photograph I took in the morning and here's two plastic bags here on the ground. And uh, so if you're skeptical, you would say, well, maybe the, the lamp fell out of the, the hammock into the plastic bag. And then I foolishly just put it in the backpack without realizing it. So that doesn't seem very plausible to me, but uh, that kind of loophole seems to facilitate uh, paranormal phenomena. We did remote viewing experiments. David's uh, a series of five experiments. Now, this is these are associated. We connected this with predicting the stock market. So here's the last one in his notes. He talks about the water. And sure enough, here's plenty of water. And uh, so it's connected to the stock market. 
the stock market went up, so he was correct four out of five times. I invested and made $36, so here we go. The group started, uh, I brought in a pinwheel, and we started doing pinwheel experiments on January the 12th. Now, this is a little bit strange for me because I set this thing up, and then I set a uh, cell phone camera so it looked at the pinwheel. I recognized it was still, it, didn't, it doesn't move when the doors close. This is in my meditation room. I would go to my bedroom. We'd start the Zoom reading, and the, the camera was a participant, so we could watch what it was viewing. And this pinwheel started moving a little bit. Now, my notes indicate it didn't move very much, but it moved a little bit. And so that started me uh, documenting my control sessions. I would check on. So here's the experimental setup. This is a mobile, and these are all spoons and forks which have been bent psycho psychokinetically uh, that I've watched uh, metal benders do this in my research. And then right here is the experimental setup for the pinwheel, and here's a mirror so the camera can look at the pinwheel and see if the mobile's turning. The, the mobile is very sensitive. If you come into the room and walk around it, it'll start turning. Uh, I, I did a lot of experiments and I meditated in this room. And if you open the door carefully, the, you, can, you can walk inside and the pinwheels will stay still. Then when I'm meditating, they remain still. I did a lot of experiments with the pinwheels. They're very sensitive to air currents and to heat, and I would set them up and photograph them before every session. So I would record the position of the pinwheel and, the, and note that it wasn't moving before the session. If you put a, a bell jar over it, they will not move. Boris explains that's the way it works. Psychic phenomena has to have some kind of loophole to work. This is a control photograph, and I use the same uh, these same positions for a number of experiments. The the center pinwheel would turn, and the two ones, the two pinwheels on the side would stay stationary. And sometimes I would have candles, and that uh, introduces a possibility of artifact. But I did a lot of control sessions, and the candles don't seem to make that much difference. August 27th was a very interesting session. We played a card guessing game. Uh, I used a brand new deck of 52 cards, but there were three jokers in the deck. We, I, I drew seven cards and we guessed whether they were red and black. Then we looked at the cards and uh, two of them were jokers. So that seemed very, very improbable. Then I dealt a card for each person. I looked at it, returned it to the deck. Two people got the 10 of spades. That seemed very improbable. I got the joker. So during this time, the pinwheels were just flying around and around very rapidly. It was very compelling to me, very clear to me that something paranormal was going on. And so I, I decided I would start videotaping my control sessions before every session, I would videotape the, the pinwheels to verify that they were completely still. And then I would publish that in my write-up of the session notes each time so people could see what was going on. Here's another control session. Sometimes you see a small amount of movement. The top pinwheel will move slightly. It's generally less than a quarter of a turn. And that's, you met, if you meditate and watch it, that's what you see. Here's a record of my photographic documentation. On July 12th, I did my first pinwheel experiment and took a still photograph of the pinwheel placement. And I took a still photograph on every subsequent experiment. On August the 27th, I took a video of the pinwheels following the experimental session. And from every subsequent 
experiment. I did a video before the experiment. On March the 16th, I did a my first pinwheel video during the experiment, and I then, then did pinwheel videos during each of the subsequent experiments for about a month and a half or so. I think the phenomena may have started declining around in March. It seemed to me like the early phenomena was more robust. These videos are available for SSE PA member review. There are two major observations. The pinwheels were basically still before the meetings. Then they would start moving during the meetings. Now, there's a great deal of variation in that movement. Sometimes they uh, were far more active than others. The second observation is that the video documentation seemed to thwart their movement. And that's difficult to, to document that. Uh, but the movement uh, without video documentation might be in the neighborhood of, uh, of revolution every five to eight seconds. And when we were videotaping, was, we did not record anything like that. Here's a chi-squared test looking at control versus test situations, highly significant. Now I realize this is not a formal experiment. Now in the video, you'll see a document I'll show the artwork in my bedroom. I'll be leaving the bedroom. I'll going down the dark hallway. Then I'll, I open the door to the meditation room and uh, try to capture the movement of the pinwheels. But the way Zoom works, the the image, the camera will will capture the image of if that, of whoever is making sound, whoever is talking. So we have to deal with that situation. Let's look at the videos. Try and videotape the paper one moving. Shut the door. Walk down the hallway. Now is it moving? I'll open the door real slowly. Just stopped. Just stopped, yeah. I nope, there it goes again. It's going. It will be all still, so that's. It has it has done numerous um, circuits. Now the other one's moving as well. One's moving counterclockwise. One's moving clockwise. Yeah, now I, I think I need to talk for it to see. It's going. It's actually oh, okay. going. Wow, it Look really is going. Look at that. Okay, I hope it's recording. Yeah, it looks like it is. That's pretty good. Yeah. And the other one, the third one that never moves. Yeah. So uh, I, we'll see. We'll see. I Hopefully we got some. You know, oh, look at that. That's so cool. Yeah, it really is starting to move now. Okay, I'm gonna shut it down. Yeah. Hundreds and hundreds of hours surveillance uh, 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 camera footage. I only got uh, uh, quite a few, very little and, and not very convincing um, uh, not very convincing um, uh, um, uh, yeah, phenomena. Um, it's because of the elusiveness. Uh, there's an intelligent part to paranormal phenomena, which which avoids direct ob observation, and that's one of the of the the that that's m maybe it's the only reliable um, law in 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 uh, paranormal in the paranormal is 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 that it's elusive that it avoids actively and intelligently uh, direct observation and especially documentation that's what i learned from uh, from having 
the worst and 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 the the the, the most frightening and and impressive phenomena going uh, going around me and my family and ex experiencing them um, every day but when i turn the camera on they stop they stop or they happen uh, out of um, out of the camera's view <clears throat> Yeah, and while I, he's I, telling, I, I while he's I, telling that story, the pinwheels going around and around. See, yeah. <laughs> hundreds. Now, in the next video, Pat mentions an experience where she was tumbling down a flight of stairs, but an angel actually carried her down the stairs, so she completely avoided being injured. Our minds that are doing it, but our minds prevent it from happening. That's my thinking. Our minds generally keep us in the, this normal reality. And the shared reality. Yeah. So where things like this possible. don't happen. But yeah. see, when you're when you're three years old and hands carry you down the stairs, you haven't been inundated with the shared reality yet, you know? Okay, let me talk so I can look at it because it's going, it's going. Awesome. It really is going now. Okay. So here's our shared reality. We have a little bit of an alternate shared reality now. Yep. And it's going around pretty steadily. Okay, well, that's good enough. Yeah. All right. Today is April the 13th. I just completed a Surat session with Pat, and the wheels were turning very, very vigorously. The whole session is astonishing. Now we're just going to check on them. Mobile is completely still. session. Camera seems to kill it. Today is April the third. You can make up your own mind regarding to the degree that these hypotheses have been supported. It seems like to me that the evidence supporting the experiential source hypothesis, the argument that the experiences have shaped belief, uh, that the evidence supports that, at least in my own life, I know that my experiences have shaped my belief. Uh, profoundly. I had never before in my life had experienced poltergeist phenomena, so many a series of them, and this business with the pinwheels has been very strange. So I think my belief in psychokinesis has been very, very strongly supported. Shamanic effectiveness hypothesis, my observation of the, the group interacting reminded me of uh, group therapy sessions that I conducted when I was a social worker in a psychiatric hospital. The, the people were uh, revealing themselves and sharing themselves. Uh, I, I wish I had some uh, more powerful way of demonstrating that or verifying it, but it's a field experiment, so 
you have to take what you can get. The trickster hypothesis, I think, has probably been supported more than anything else. Uh, this thing is way, way off the scale with regard to uh, being unusual, but we'll see what happens. This is an ongoing experiment, so we'll see what happens in the future. This is an ongoing experiment. If you would like to participate, contact me at beinghere at gmail.com and put Surratt in the title of your email. Thank you so much for listening.